what do we really mean when we say the First Amendment? Well, it's obvious. We mean the most robust protection of speech rights, religious liberty, freedom of the press, and freedom of association in the world today. Correct, says Eugene Volokh. Absolutely correct. But it could change. Listen to this conversation with one of the country's leading experts on freedom of speech and constitutional law. Eugene Volokh is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA and an expert on free speech law, tort law, religious freedom, and other First Amendment issues. He also runs a First Amendment amicus brief clinic at UCLA and a blog called The Volik Conspiracy, where he and others talk about urgent issues of the day. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. So first of all, um, welcome. I'm sitting here with Eugene Volokh. Thank you so much, Eugene, for making time today to talk with me. Thanks very much for making time to come out here. So you teach law at UCLA. You're the Gary T. Schwartz Professor of Law. You've written a lot on free speech on the First Amendment, a First Amendment casebook in several editions. And when I was thinking about preparing for this conversation, I saw the headline in the Times from a couple days ago about the terrible shooting in New Zealand, this uh, mass murder at two mosques. The headline in the Times said, extremist hate fuels New Zealand attacks. And I wanted to see if we can start there to say that the Times put the headline across the front page saying that hate fuels an attack, this link between hate expression and action which they're putting as a headline. And it struck me as a headline that maybe even several years ago we wouldn't have seen in the same way. That maybe this link wouldn't have been made by the Times right away to say that hate fuels an attack. So I'm interested in how we unpack this, what hate's supposed to mean in this context. Yeah, well, hate is not a precise term, uh, but that again, headlines are not known for being very precise. Uh, one thing that I do try to remind my students is that free speech is protected not because it's harmless, it's protected even though it often is harmful. And one way of thinking about it is look not forward from a particular statement, the consequence of which may be very hard to trace, but backward from an event. Mm -hmm. Stalin didn't murder tens of millions of people, Mao didn't murder tens of millions of people, Hitler didn't murder tens of millions of people because they were just angry. Mm -hmm. and the people working for them were just angry. There was an ideology behind mm -hmm. it. The same thing is true with the September 11th attacks. The same is true with holy wars, uh, uh, whether Christian, relatively rare these days, but back in the day there were very many of those, or extremist jihadist ideology today. Obviously some murders are just coming from ordinary, everyday human passions. But the mass murders, the, uh, generally speaking, are going to be stemming from some kind of ideas, and they're usually hateful, whether they're hateful based on race or religion or class or uh, country of nationality, not even ethnicity so much as, as citizenship or loyalty. So when you're talking about certainly the, the tens of millions of deaths or in the thousands or many of the dozen deaths shooting, some of them are probably not terribly linked to any particular ideology, but many are. Uh, yes, of course, uh, it comes from ideologies, and hate is often an important part of them. And when you, when you bring this up with your students, let's say in first year of con law, sort of generally, and as you said, hate speech is free speech protects speech, not because it's good and helpful always, but bec also because it can express sentiments that are terrible and we don't condone or we are a poor. So it doesn't really make a distinction. So the link in this country is usually that people very quickly say, hate speech in this country is constitutionally protected. So that's one thing people need to understand in the first place. So when you're saying hate, hateful ideas can lead to violence, yes, we can acknowledge that, as you said, in different contexts. At the same time, we take a very principled stance, both legally and culturally, that all speech should be protected. Uh, I think that's right. All ideas, generally speaking, are protected, not necessarily all implementations of those, of those ideas. Uh, one way I think of thinking about it is that uh, it's not like there's some ideology hate out there. Yeah, what there are are many different kinds of ideologies. 
uh, which have kind of a reasonable, at least a plausible core, maybe you might disagree with them, but you say, oh, there's, there's an insightful social criticism there. And then radiating outward, uh, with some ideologies quite far out, some, some less far out, are things that progressively get more and more violent. And the violence is often justified as an act of love, but an act of love for some at the expense of others. So certainly we've seen in the past century that that was true with basically ideology of economic reform. You had liberal calls for various kinds of economic reform, which I think sometimes were right, sometimes maybe counterproductive, but one could certainly debate. Going out from there was democratic socialism, which was, I think, a disaster in many ways, in part because it, it predictably led to undemocratic socialism. And then from there was the ideology of mass murder in the service of a class struggle. Uh, we have long seen that with religions, right? Uh, um, most religions have a, a core where it's peaceful. I'm not saying anything as a theological matter necessarily. It's peaceful, but it's just because most people who adhere to particular religious beliefs, they just want to live their ordinary lives. Mm -hmm. uh, at least over the span of centuries, that becomes the, the, the bulk of the view. But there often is a militant version of it that is that they become dominant at particular times. Uh, that we see the same thing with uh, anti-abortion ideology. We see the same thing with labor ideology. We see the same thing with with a uh, uh, um, ecological ideology. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I think American law concluded early on is that attempts to try to police the extremes quite quickly uh, move on to restricting the substantive and valuable underlying uh, ideas. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a sound conclusion for American law to have reached. And when you said right now that there's a, sometimes a reasonable core to these ideas, some ideas are benign, they want to improve things for some people, the link between the, the fringe groups, the ones who act on these things, and then act really violence that the government should and does have some business regulating. The government actually is, in, is, is there to protect minorities, for example, minority groups. So where's this transition you just described? Right. A really big transition. But the reasonable core part, I think, is that strikes people as hard to find when you look at the fringe groups. They say they right. link back to right. someone right. who had a good idea at some point. Right. Uh, so I think the answer that American law gives is, generally speaking, outright threats of violence. Someone saying, I'm going to kill you. Uh, that can be criminally punished. Uh, advocacy of imminent and likely lawless conduct. So the classic example is giving a speech outside a building. It could be a mosque, it could be a, a, an abortion clinic, it could be a draft office urging a mob to burn it down. That's punishable. But broader ideology, broader advocacy of particular views uh, is not. Uh, so to take an example of an ideology which in many ways is quite perilous and has another one that has caused trem obviously tremendous damage in the past century, but a centuries before nationalism. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, 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 certainly we see extremist nationalism uh, being potentially very dangerous. Uh, at the same time, you know, there is a, most countries, the majority of people have certain nationalist sentiments, if only to the point that people who are in our country, who are citizens of our country, deserve our sympathy, deserve our help, deserve our protection in a way that outsiders are not. There have to be decisions made about uh, uh, whom we allow into the country, uh, how many people we allow into the country. Um, so uh, uh, the uh, uh, again, you're quite right that that the that the when especially when somebody goes on to say kill, whether it's in the name of class struggle or the name of the environment or the name of nationalism, it's very easy to say that that's horrible. The problem is, uh, and as, and this was most learned by American law in the context of communism, is that it is that it is too easy for the government to draw connections between the advocacy of violent revolution, for example, which by definition being violent revolution involves killing, uh, and sharp criticism of the existing, of the existing uh, um, uh, uh, legal regime and the existing power structure. So when you refer to this history, actually, that the government took very strong position on communist ideology, communist thought, and regulated it. So it right. wasn't always the case in this country. Oh, yeah, the yeah, government yeah. said, you can kind of say pretty much anything you want, and we'll go back to this exception you made, unless you're inciting 
violence outside of a right. lecture hall or a mosque right. or a synagogue or a church, which is, we'll get back to. But sort of the government, some at some point in this country, in this country, not too far in the past, took a different approach. Oh, oh, surely that's true. And one again, one of the things that I want to tell uh, to te teach my students is uh, uh, that there's long been a libertarian free speech tradition in American law, uh, but it has not always been dominant. And uh, it, it, there have been times when it was actually pretty dominant in practice. And the libertarian, can you define that for me? Uh, sure, just, just libertarian in this context, meaning protecting the liberty of expression. I don't okay. mean libertarian in the broader political right. sense. Okay. Um, so, for, uh, so sometimes, actually, uh, throughout most of American history, there actually was very broad uh, spectrum of things expressed, but many of them were expressed under some degree of legal peril. Mm -hmm. um, so we see that obviously early in the in the Republic with uh, uh, persecutions for seditious libel. They were very controversial then. Uh, the ones we most remember are the federal level with the Sedition Act, uh, and but then there were some at the state level as well, including until the early 1800s. Uh, which then, the, which the court doesn't take up, right? They actually lost uh, and they uh, expire, but the court never really right, right. right. The U.S. But this was very early, right. 1791. Exactly. So this is sort of uh, 70, so actually later, 1798 yeah. 98, is right. when the Sedition yeah. Act is passed. The U.S. Supreme Court never reaches that. Yeah. The state constitutional, excuse me, uh, the 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 uh, state persecutions. The Supreme Court never reaches because at the time the Bill of Rights didn't apply to state governments. Right. Uh, then during uh, the Civil War, uh, Lincoln uh, and, uh, and mostly his, uh, his subordinates, but, but Lincoln endorses this, uh, restricts uh, the speech of some uh, uh, supporters of the South and critics of right. the war effort. Following on the gag rule in Congress, 1836 to 1844, when abolition is, there's a limit on the discussion right. of abolition in Congress. Right. Right. So this is a, right. you well, say a, I would distinguish the Congress thing because Congress has the power to restrict what it hears and what is said, what is said within, within Congress. In fact, you can't imagine a rule of content neutrality in Congress where everybody is equally free to speak about anything at any time. But it's interesting, but, I think, as an example, because it's such a decisive issue for the country. And it's interesting, of course, every body of people speaking together has to regulate speech. So there are restrictions, and the government takes a position on certain types of speech. Well, not this Congress one now. But. I, I would distinguish the Congress one, but you're quite right that uh, there were restrictions on advocacy of abolition and criticism of slavery imposed by, as a matter of law, by state governments, and as I recall, also were imposed uh, under federal uh, rules as to the post office. Mm -hmm. So these really were restrictions on speech outside of, of Congress. Uh, and in fact, part of the radical Republican criticism of the slave power at the time and after the, the Civil War when they were enacting the 14th Amendment, which has been read as, as extending right. the Bill of Rights to the states, was that the slave power suppressed not just blacks but also whites. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it was much harsher towards the blacks, but white Southerners uh, and white Northerners were also saw their liberties being stripped away, in particular the liberty of speech by the law. So there's no doubt that that had happened. Then during uh, World War One, there was also prosecution of uh, advocacy of opposition to the draft, sharp criticism of the war, and then uh, following World War One, there were uh, restrictions on the advocacy of uh, revolutionary socialism, essentially. So, and these two examples, sorry, World War One is one where it's, it concerns the draft or it's considered treasonous to say you shouldn't join the army, this is a wrong war. All right, treason is a little bit imprecise here, but at yeah. least it's considered criminal. So what's the idea? What's, it's, not, it's not treason. What is it considered? Why, well, is it, why does the government think it has to restrict this type of uh, I'm probably being unnecessarily uh, picky no, it's here. Good. Uh, treason is the only crime that is expressly defined in the Constitution. All right. And so to something to be treason, it has to uh, be either levying war on the United States or giving aid and comfort to the enemies mm -hmm. of the United States. Uh, and um, mm -hmm. uh, that the uh, there were laws during World War One that banned uh, speech that had the tendency to interfere with the draft, mm -hmm. but there were separate statutes. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, they were not technically denominated treason. But the rationale in a lot of these, including the advocacy, ex including restrictions and advocacy of abolition of slavery, was that th this kind of speech has a bad tendency, and the tendency is towards criminal conduct that if you sharply criticize the draft, some people will refuse to go along with the draft. If you, sh if you sharply denounce the existing structure and talk about how wonderful the, the Soviets were, some, uh, some people will say, oh, we ought to start violating the law. And there, unlike with draft resistance, would be violently violating the law. Likewise, restrictions on criticism of slavery and advocacy of abolition, the worry there was that they would help foment uh, slave rebellions. And in some ways, in that last example, 
it did lead to a war. Oh, right. right. That it actually is that people, some people claim these laws are not just immoral, they're unjust, they shouldn't be laws, and then to overthrow them, it would right. be a legal dispute and became a war. Right, right. So, right. so that's the fear that actually would so, undo the republic entirely. Right, and in um, modern First Amendment law is chiefly a reaction to uh, the restrictions imposed during and shortly after World War I. So there were these famous dissents by Holmes and Brandeis. Holmes, at first, was on board with this, but then pretty quickly shifted his views, culminating in the 1920s, starting in the late 19-teens, um, and those have largely become the law. Now, interestingly, during the uh, 1950s, where there were attempts to restrict uh, communist advocacy, in many ways, they were, were less restrictive than during World War I in part precisely because there was something of a lesson learned by the legal system from the World War I restrictions. Let me ask you something not as a law student, so yes. in some ways as a, as a person who follows the law. So dissenting opinions around 1919 and the 1920s become mm -hmm. one of the bases for how we think about the First Amendment today. Because what I hear a lot is people saying, this is the First Amendment. But what you're saying, there's a history of jurisprudence. Right. Where people take different right, positions on it. So in some ways, I've always thought, when people say the First Amendment, they mean the current accepted valid rulings that relate to the First Amendment. Right? That's it's absolutely not the First true. Amendment. Because the First Amendment, as you said, it wasn't really used until 1919. It took a lot of effort. And then these are dissenting opinions, which then actually become right. one of the greatest right. insights that we Law have. can change. Free speech law can change. Equal protection law can change. Uh, our understandings of, of due process uh, changes. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And indeed, it's quite right uh, that the text of the Constitution in these areas resolves very little. In some areas, it resolves a lot. We know that the president has to be 35 years or older. Uh, but in, uh, uh, in these areas, it, the text resolves very little. And uh, uh, when we say the First Amendment, what we really mean is First Amendment law, and what we really mean is the body of precedents developed chiefly by the US Supreme Court, uh, coupled with some sense of traditions and attitudes developed outside the court as well. But it's overwhelmingly the doing of the US Supreme Court. And there's no doubt things could change. And this is interesting what you just said, coupled with some sense of the traditions and norms developed outside of the law, because the court has to pay attention to some degree to what's happening in society. Oh, of right? course. Same sort of, and so it's interesting. I mean, I want to get back to sort of the idea of what you're saying about these extreme views related to sort of more acceptable ideologies. But recently, Justice Thomas wants to revisit what's considered libel law, sort of the, the limitations on suing the press for printing things against the government. So this is New York. Oh, no, no. So no, he's not speaking about limitations on suing the press for printing things against the government. He's speaking about uh, uh, limitations on suing the press, among others, for uh, uh, false statements that damage a particular person's reputation. And that person could include an official in the government. It could include a government right. official, it could include others. So this case is an early 60s case. New York Times v. Sullivan, that's right. And so when Thomas refers to this, is that a legitimate way to think, well, you know, we look at how the way the country is, and in some cases we have to occasionally revisit. What prompts the court to say the norms and so the society changes to revisit this case because there was a lot of discussion about this for people saying, how can he even mention this case? Well, this is the law right. the book. Of course so it's legitimate. Acceptable. Somebody make the law, somebody else can argue right. about, in favor of changing the law. Right. Um, at the same time, it's noteworthy it was just one justice's opinion. Right. Nobody else signed on to it. And I do not expect, I doubt anybody else right. will sign on to it. I don't expect certainly a majority to sign on to it. Um, uh, so Justice Thomas, generally takes the view uh, that uh, the Constitution ought to be interpreted according to its original meaning. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means uh, the uh, uh, some parts as to original meaning as of 1791, other parts original meaning as of 1868, uh, which is when the 14th Amendment, which has been read as incorporating the First Amendment against the states, uh, was enacted. And presumably some other parts that were enacted more recently should be read with an eye towards the original meaning at the time. Um, and uh, it is, uh, original meaning is, uh, uh, arguments are sometimes faulted on the grounds that it's too hard to determine original meaning, but it does seem pretty clear that the, that the framers of the Constitution, and I don't just mean the particular people who signed it, but the, right. the, 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 that generation, yeah. um, as well as the generation uh, of people who ratified the 14th Amendment, 
uh, they, uh, uh, they viewed uh, libel as something of an exception to the First Amendment, and a fairly broad exception, at least when it comes to false statements of fact about particular people. And known to be false, correct? Uh, no, it's no, not, including so ones which are with mistakes. just false statements. Right. I say something about you, so right. Professor right. Malik does this or this or this, and if it damages your career in some way, right. you could say this is a problem. Right, right. Yeah. right. In fact, historically, the rule was that to be liable, something simply had to be a, a disparaging statement uh, that, uh, about someone. And then it's the defendant that had to prove its truth. Uh, and not just prove that he thought it was true, but prove that it really was true. Now, uh, there were there were some limitations of that. Libel law was developed by smart people with with uh, uh, some sense that certain kinds of things need to be protected. So, for example, uh, accurate reports of government proceedings would be protected, even if within those proceedings there are false allegations uh, that, that are being quoted in those reports. Um, so uh, it was a complicated body of law, but it's pretty clear it was very far from the modern body of law. Uh, now, Justice Thomas takes a very originalist view of the First Amendment. Back in the day, Justice Black, who was sort of an originalist, more or less of the left in some respects, uh, t took a similar view. And for them, even old precedents could be revisited quite easily and should be revisited in the name of uh, reestablishing the original meaning. Just to close this, would the understanding of libel for the, in an originalist understanding, be different from New York versus Sullivan. Right, right, absolutely. So New York Times versus Sullivan says uh, that uh, uh, statements about public officials and public figures uh, are uh, categorically protected against libel liability unless they're actually outright lies, unless they're knowingly false mm -hmm. or at least said with the knowledge that they're very likely false. Mm -hmm. That's called reckless disregard, but basically it's knowledge of likely falsehood. Uh, that's sometimes labeled actual malice, but that's one of those legal misnomers that really confuses much more than a review. It doesn't mean you're a mean person. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, uh, whereas uh, around the time of the framing and in the late 18, uh, 1860s, when the 14th Amendment was enacted again, uh, applying the First mm -hmm. Amendment to the states, um, uh, even reasonable mistakes, even situations where somebody tried really hard to figure out what was going on and just, just aired, even that could be libelous. Although there were, especially by the 1860s, some defenses in certain mm -hmm. kinds of situations, so-called privileges, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, would protect certain kinds of mistakes. But in any case, the rule is quite different. But, so Thomas, and before him, Black, many decades before, uh, were pretty rigid originalists, by and large, although even that not entirely. But that's not the view of most justices on the court, including ones who have originalist sympathies, mm -hmm. like Scalia mm -hmm. before his death, or like Gorsuch mm -hmm. and Kavanaugh. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they also care, and Thomas does in some measure, because because everybody has to care about precedent, but they care a lot about precedent. And I think it's pretty unlikely they're going to re revisit this precedent. And Thomas also opened up, I guess, just suggesting that it would be fine to leave the states alone, let them decide certain things, and the federal government shouldn't be, or the court... Uh, right, right. Government. Well, that is part of his originalist yeah. view, because that was the understanding. Uh, around the time of the framing, the, the, uh, the remember, the Bill of Rights wasn't applicable right. to the states, and the thought was, we restrain the federal government with a First Amendment as to its actions. Right. State governments have their own bills of rights, which everybody understood ought to have some protection for freedom of speech and freedom of the press. It, many at the time didn't actually have that written down in them, but it was pretty broadly accepted that there ought to be some level of protection, whether in the state constitution or in state laws. Right. Uh, but that would be a matter for state uh, ju uh, judges, state voters, state legislators, and not for, uh, not for federal courts. We've moved a long distance since then, in part because of the enactment of the 14th Amendment. Uh, Which most lay people and non-legal scholars would think, well, so to go back from before 1868 and say the state should be left to do this would, as if it would take that out, that the right. First Amendment is right. now applicable. To right. Well, uh, Thomas doesn't question the incorporation of the First Amendment through the 14th Amendment. It's actually a little complicated. There are some people have questioned it. Uh, uh, I, I, he, he is not one of them. Right. Uh, he actually argues that, that the particular legal reason given for incorporation is subtly wrong, but he was on board with the incorporation. But his view is, look, free speech is protected by the federal constitutional provision, which applies to the states, but has a particular scope. 
and then it's protected by whatever other protection states may choose to add. Mm -hmm. And his view is, of course, there should be this protection. It's just that we've misjudged its scope. It should be somewhat narrower. Not vastly narrower, but in this area, somewhat narrower. And then there will be that baseline of federal protection, and then states could provide more protection if they wish to. What I found interesting about this, this moment when Justice Thomas in a dissent writes this, and there's a strong reaction in people saying, this must not be touched. This law has been there since 1964. This gives us the way we have worked for now 50 years. It's the best possible way of doing it. And what's interesting, and when, on the flip side, when people say, maybe the way we deal with hate speech, for example, is not quite the most protective of minorities in this country, or it foments violence, or it creates a culture of fear, etc. These things which are not quite incitement yet, there are people seem to say, you can't touch that. So what I think is interesting that there's been a discussion where saying the way this country regulates and considers speech, hate speech must always be protected. And when Thomas said, let's look at speech, how it's protected, the same people said, how can you even open up this discussion? This is unacceptable. So I'm trying to understand how to... But I'm sorry, so you're describing a consistency. No, I'm, tr I'm trying yeah, to say that... By and large, the people are... Many people are the, skeptical of attempts to cut back on speech protection, or whether it's libel or... Let's say rethink it. Let's right. say rethink it, whether it goes good or bad, that's kind of an right. opinion matter, but sort of to rethink it in some ways, what Thomas was saying wasn't interesting, well, let's rethink it. And other right. people are saying, let's rethink it. And then what I think opens up is an interesting conversation, which is both legal in the courts and then also in the culture, that a lot of people are saying not just in relation to this shooting or this massacre in New Zealand, but the synagogue shooting, the church shooting in South Carolina, these attacks on the gay nightclub in Orlando, sort of saying, what is this commitment to protect hate speech? And I'm paraphrasing, at all cost. Is this really benefiting everybody in our society in the same way? So I think this conversation is an interesting one to have, and I think there's been a moment to say, this is not a conversation Americans have. We're committed to it, we protect hate speech, we're different from other democracies. Well, uh, certainly one should be open to conversations, whether it's about free speech or about gender equality or racial equality or uh, same-sex rights or abortion rights or whatever else, uh, because as kind of thoughtful people, I think we have to recognize that many of the things that we consider are clearly correct might be mistaken. Uh, and that's especially so when there are things that we, that used to be, used to be considered ridiculous 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and now uh, we, we sort of accept as holy writ. That, that's kind of, that, that's, and that's kind interesting of interesting. You've taken positions that I think are, that's exactly right. You said in some cases, very new conceptions in new ways, sort of marriage uh -huh. equality, you uh -huh. this is just wouldn't have been conceivable right. to many people. Some right. people actually, always thought this is right, so it's not that nobody thought yeah, that. Yeah, it's true, not no racial but very equality. Few. A lot of people in this country thought racial equality should be given. For example, probably all black Americans always thought this is a birthright, and it took the country quite a while. A lot of people would think, but you're saying that things are open to intelligent debate. What I'm sort of saying is that sometimes when you encounter First Amendment questions, mm -hmm. it is such a rigid position to say this is the best possible right. way of doing it, and the, all the other ways are right. wrong. Right, we should, we should never uh, approach this sort of with a sense that this is somehow holy writ uh, that, that cannot possibly be altered. At the same time, we also, all of us, have some judgment about which things are worth revisiting and which are not. Right. It just, and sometimes it's sort of sh a shorthand judgment, like we've got to decide how much attention to pay to the particular proposal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, I think many people's reaction to Thomas's proposal was, look, you know, uh, we see what he's saying, but it's not a good idea because our judgment, may be mistaken, but our, our quick judgment is that, in fact, uh, libel law is potentially very perilous to public debate. Uh, to be sure, though, America was and uh, uh, did have lots of public debate before New York Times v. Sullivan, but especially given the, mm -hmm. the, the magnitude of some libel awards that, 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 uh, that have been urged and been sought in some situations and the, uh, the, the ease of suing today compared to, in many ways compared to then, um, uh, we think that that's going to be bad for democracy. 
so I think that's also a plausible reaction, not a, not sort of a knee jerk, obviously wrong, but a, hey, we've got a pretty decent system going. Let's not mess with it, especially when we can really see the downside. And, and I think that the same thing is true with calls to try to suppress uh, 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 advocacy of uh, certain views, whether about race or sexual orientation or religion or sex or whatever else, uh, under the rubric of hate speech. It doesn't doesn't help, I think, that so, that the term hate speech is also off, always thrown around so much and rarely defined by those who are throwing it around. And when the definitions are offered, mm -hmm. uh, generally speaking, those definitions prove to be very, very broad. Uh, so I think a lot of people have kind of a quick reaction saying, we've thought about it, right. others have thought about it, we've generally rejected it, not particularly interested in revisiting that question. And to stay right there, so in, in, as you know, there are people um, who think we should revisit it. And we should revisit it because sure. it actually foments violence. It encourages right. these lone wolves. Let's say it's right. not attribution. You've written about that. It's very hard to establish kind of the purpose of saying something. It's very difficult to determine whether this person, you know, embraced this ideology, these ideas, and acted on it. So these things are tricky in individual cases. But there is um, a vibrant and robust discussion of people saying this isn't really benefiting right. certain minorities sure. to sure. keep this out there and to keep the statement, no, we must protect this, otherwise we risk our democracy. There are a lot of groups who are saying, you're risking our lives at this moment. We are at risk because of this kind of speech. So in some ways, I think this is a really interesting conversation. To right. Have. Let me give you an example. So I was driving in a pretty rich neighborhood of LA, and there was a pretty seemingly fairly expensive car with a bumper sticker saying, guillotine the 1%. <laughs> now, I, I don't... It, in some respects, kind of rude for me to say this, but in fact, actually, just because my wife is a lawyer, I'm, I'm uh, trained as a lawyer, I, we make decent money, we will probably be in the 1%. That is literally an endorsement of a view of murder. And not only just ridiculous, well, obviously hyperbolic, no. In fact, within the last 100 years, including in the country in which I was born and in which my parents lived half their lives, my grandparents, whom I knew well, uh, lived a great bulk of their lives, uh, there was a campaign of mass murder aimed at people like me. And this was just you. The, the, this was the USSR. The USSR. The USSR. Okay. Although, of course, uh, uh, in China there was also a, a similar campaign, and right. it's an interesting question: just just who murdered more? Right. Uh, and uh, uh, now, I imagine if we actually brought in the driver, he'd say, "Oh well, I'm being. This is just hyperbole." But you know. Uh, a lot of the things that people condemn as hate speech uh, with violent rhetoric, people would say the same and would, would often be telling but the truth. This is a really interesting example. So there's a kind of historical reference to the French Revolution, the guillotine. Um, and as you're saying, in the USSR or in China during the Cultural Revolution or in Cambodia or in many countries, there is a real history right. of absolute kind of rampage of violence against the rich. Not in this country, probably in the same way. In this country, is another history. So when someone sees a bumper sticker that targets a racial minority, which are usually the cases that become the cases of hate speech in this country. They're rarely cases about killing the 1%. They're always about racial minorities, or in many cases. A racial minority would say, there's a history in this country that makes me very concerned. The right. way you would be concerned in the USSR, if it was still the USSR, which is it's no longer, it's Russia, a different country. So in some ways, does the history inform these discussions? You know, I'm trying to get to, and they're not equivalent as everywhere. You see this in the back. You know, it didn't, Tesla, happen, it didn't happen in Russia either until it did. Right. Karl Marx yeah. thought that the Russia, I'm told, uh, <laughs> uh, that, that Russia was uh, was going to be the last place that would have a communist revolution. Uh, so, it was always that you're so, converting to the proletariat. I, I live in the world as well <laughs> right. as in the country, right? All of us do. Right. Right. And this world has a history of literally tens right. of millions right. of people murdered as a result of the ideology uh, mm -hmm. dis uh, 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 described there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, it, and of course, it, it's true, it's unlikely there's going to be violent revolution this way, just because America seems to be a pretty stable country, uh, at least at this point. Uh, but it's also unlikely that there's going to be, uh, there's going to be outright race war in the US. Mm -hmm. it, but on the other hand, if the concern is targeted violence against people because of their race or mm -hmm. their class, mm -hmm. that's always a possibility. So then the question is, so one question I always ask the people when they say, uh, what, uh, well, there ought to be a hate speech uh, exception, mm -hmm. is I ask them, well, give me a definition of hate speech. Mm -hmm. So for example, one thing that's pretty common is urging hostility or discrimination or violence mm -hmm. against people based on race, religion, sex, and so on and so forth. 
So I asked them, okay, so let's say somebody says conservative Christians, you know, they adhere to this horrible ideology. It's anti-gay, it's anti-transgender, it's misogynistic, it's religiously bigoted. Uh, and I, I just, I, I, think, I think they're a menace, they're a menace to America. A not uncommon argument that, that, that one hears, uh, obviously hears more when conservative Christian are, are, uh, ideologies are, are particularly in play. For example, I remember as I was sort of growing up, it was at a time when Jerry Falwell's moral majority was around, mm -hmm. and understandably was sharply criticized. Literally, that is advocacy of hostility and in some measure mm -hmm. discrimination mm -hmm. based on religion, just like a con sharp condemnation of, of extremist Islam or even non-extremist Islam is uh, is as well. Uh, so then, you know, so I suppose people say, well, no, 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 we don't mean that. Well, okay, fine. Well, give me a definition that does mean that. So sometimes you can imagine a situation where uh, advocacy of outright violence. And if you, so uh, uh, if, if you want to ban advocacy of violence, uh, there is something where I do think advocacy of violence is much uh, is much less valuable precisely because it is a right. violence. Uh, I would like to see what people say about, say, the supposed anti-violence. So I just everybody saying saying you've written a great argue, uh, article on slippery slope arguments, but you've given an example in saying there could be a violence. Right, but, but this is not a slippery slope argument. So you're just saying there's an equivalence that could be made. So I'm sort of trying to... It's, it's not just, even that. Let me try to ask yeah. something in terms of definition. Okay. Sure. So you're saying you so one of the definitions of hate speech would be targeting um, individuals based on group belonging. They belong to a certain group. We hate this group. We want to kill or exterminate or hurt them or commit violence. And you're saying that could be done against doctors who provide abortions. And I think you've written about some of those cases. And other people say it could be written against people who belong um, to a group of racial minorities, etc. Um, so you're saying to restrict one, which means where does it lead? Couldn't you? It's not a useful definition because it's too vague. Or? Oh well, yeah. It's not that I'm is the, the the definition at least that I'm talking about. Well, if we adopt it, then eventually we might adopt some other definition. That is actually a serious risk, mm -hmm. uh, which both the court and many many scholars and advocacy groups have pointed to. But but here that's not the concern. The concern is if you adopt this definition, then the definition itself would already cover those things. So the definition that I quoted you really would, right. if fairly applied, right. applied to sharp criticism of, say, conservative Christians, right. uh, or for that matter, uh, condemnation of whites for enjoying white privilege, which is and, advocacy in some and measure of hostility and discrimination. Of, to play the us. role of, not the devils, but some advocate to say, what would be the social loss if actually people who advocate direct violence against certain groups are restricted from doing this? So you can't put a list of people who are doctors in health clinics, you can't put a list of your neighbors who belong to a certain minority, you can't do that and say these people should all be dead. right. Right. So, so, so that's uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, I, I like that in part because it tries to come up with a definition that is somewhat narrower, and then we, we can talk about it. So, in, so this is actually one of the things that in my in my class one of probably the second problem is uh, imagine somebody says we, there ought to be an exception for advocacy of murder. Yeah. Uh, not advocacy of hostility, not advocacy of discrimination, advocacy of murder. Uh, so, so you know, that's something that's potentially more plausible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why hasn't the court been willing to adopt that? Well, one thing is advocacy of murder really would include advocacy of violent revolution. Mm -hmm. But you might say, certainly many people in the 1950s did, I don't think they were fools or, mm -hmm. or, or evil, said, look, you know, we should draw the line at violent revolution. Uh, Nonviolent revolution, fine, uh, but but advocacy of violent revolution uh, is is uh, something something that that's punishable. Um, part of the problem is that what you, you have to look at it from a dynamic perspective. Uh, the ad the people whom you are going after aren't idiots either. Mm -hmm. So they're going to say, oh, okay, fine. I can't say, well, let's go out there and murder capitalists, mm -hmm. or let's go out there and murder Muslims. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say lots of things mm -hmm. that create a climate in which people mm -hmm. dislike them, devalue them, same with police officers or abortion providers or whatever else. So then what happens, and this is a slippery slope argument, but this is a very real and common slippery slope, is people say, well, wait a minute, this is obviously an end run around our wonderful, proper prohibition, so now we have to go after the other things. We, it's not enough to go after the communist communists, we have to go after the fellow travelers, we have to go after the useful idiots. So what if you limit it and said, okay, that's too much, we'll be overbroad, we can't do that, we can restrict all this all the racist, sexist, anti 
doctor rhetoric, but we'll only really regulate this one thing. And as you know, many other democracies. I'm sorry, which one thing? We only say advocacy of murder as a direct. It right. has to be really a sentence that says it's. And so the, the test has to be very narrow and to say. Right. And this, as you know, other democracy take an approach. And I'm just curious where the court wants to step away right. and says, we are risking something here. We would restrict something that, and this is this next sentence, I don't know, because. It's important to have it out in the open is one of the arguments. Otherwise, we wouldn't know it exists. Or if we restrict that, we must restrict other things, and we are not the country right. that does that. Well, uh, so first of all, as I understand it, Europe uh, goes far beyond advocacy of murder. I think it was Bernard Lewis at one point uh, who was fined by a French court for, okay. basically, yeah. for basically saying that he thought the killings of uh, Armenians in uh, in uh, the Ottoman Empire were not part of a kind of a coherent strategy of genocide. But let me just uh, add one thing. Yeah, I mean, as much as I know, and this is France, so this is not kind of some no, weird uh, outlier yeah. of Europe. Yeah, but I would say still, there's a, there are many cases that we can cite that are on the face absurd of restriction. Brigitte Bardot, or some actress saying this or that. But the intent of the law in Canada, in Brazil, in uh-huh. South Africa, in European countries, I think is not to restrict someone from doing something silly, but it is actually to stop this kind of violence that targets minorities. So, so, so maybe think, that's the intent. Don't you think that's the intent behind it? I mean, it's not to limit some right. actress from so, saying silly things. In them. So that may be the intent, right. uh, but not only is that not the only effect, it is also not the way they're written. So you're suggesting okay. something, and you're calling on the Euro- in European model, but you're suggesting something that is, in fact, as I understand it, okay. not the European rule. So I don't could, know of any European So could there be a better way of doing it? Let's not use Canada and oh, Europe right, as a model. Right. Could there so, be a way to narrowly write so, it? And I'm, I'm interested, as you can hear, I'm interested in sort of saying, how do you respond to people who say, this reflexive protection of hate speech denies the lived reality of people who are not just living in a climate where it's unpleasant, you see a bumper sticker, but they actually live in fear. And that's not what a country should really let its minority populations experience constantly. Well, I'm Jewish. Uh, There are, as best I can tell, and the statistics on hate crimes are very uh, complicated, mushy and hard, hard to evaluate. But certainly from the point of view of reported hate crimes, and there's always the, the, the difficulty in that there is a dis, dis, uh, just disparity in reporting among very, uh, 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 in, in various situations, uh, Jews are the ones who are the subject of the largest uh, uh, number of hate crimes per capita. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I'll tell you my lived reality, and maybe I'm just fortunate in living in LA, is. Mm-hmm. If I'm worried for my life, mm-hmm. it's not from anti-Semitic violence. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that is true for basically every other uh, group in America today. Mm-hmm. Uh, that your risk of being violently attacked mm-hmm. uh, 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 is non-trivial. Your risk of being violently attacked because of your race, your religion, in case of Jews, basically ethnicity, mm-hmm. uh, even sexual orientation, uh, is a tiny, tiny fraction of your risk of, uh, of, uh, of, of any other crim- criminal. I mean, I think you're right. The statistics are very hard to come by. I think what people are trying to say, let's say, and we'll move away from this kind of direct risk to my personal life, but I think trans women of color would the statistics say their risk is probably greater more threatened for violent crime because of their identity so, so it, but in so it, let's so say maybe this is the it may be that in fact actually transgender people are particularly and, uh, and particularly targeted let's see what we're saying that is something the government should and would want to prevent the difficulty is to be prevent the expression of sort of that right. these people should not live right it's well, sort of, of course we would want to protect all members of society in a way, but what you're saying, it's, it's hard so to how do how much benefit do you think right. you'll actually get right. out of a rule that says you cannot say we should kill group X, right. whether it is capitalist pigs or, pol- or police officers right. or blacks or right. uh, Jews or right. uh, transgender right. women of color or whatever right. else. Right. Right. Uh, my guess is you're going to get very little mileage out of that because what will happen is people will say, no, no, I'm not saying we should kill them. I'm just saying all these other things. Uh, then I think people will say, uh oh, well, wait a minute. In order to really offer the protection, as opposed to a real, just a mere illusion of protection, right. we can't just limit it to bans on advocacy of killing. We have to limit it, uh, we have to extend it to bans on speech that kind of devalues, dehumanizes, whatever else. So now, in order to make the restriction work, 
you, you need to make it much broader. Either you have a very narrow restriction, with, right. which you can defend on the grounds that it's very narrow, right. but it's going to be essentially ineffectual. Or to make it more effective, and I'm not sure how effective you can make right. it, but to make it more effective, uh, you have to make, you, you have to uh, abandon the argument that, oh, we're making it super narrow. Right. So and transgender is, I think, an excellent example that I think there is a debate going on. It is far from resolved about how society should deal with transgender people. It is, as I understand it, generally viewed as stemming from what is thought to be a mental health condition, gender dysphoria. Uh, and the question is whether to treat it by, uh, by essentially treating people as their believed gender and, if necessary, going through various quite intrusive, as I understand it, uh, uh, pharmacological and uh, uh, surgical procedures. Or they should say, no, no, this is, in fact, this is a mental condition that we should not kind of go along with, but we should try to, we should try to see if there's some other ways of curing that or, in any event, um, uh, or, or in any event, not uh, not uh, 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 give people the various surgeries and, right. and the like. Or, uh, 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 and uh, it's an interesting question as to w w uh, what the uh, uh, the right uh, solution is. As I understand it, psychologists generally take take the view that it should be accepted and should be kind of the, uh, people's uh, identity should be uh, should be kind of gone along with in that respect. They may be completely right. That's certainly not yet the view of the law. It's certainly not yet the view of the law of very many other countries. And then there are all these tangential. You mean the law doesn't accept that people can self-identify? No, no. The law doesn't, for example, accept the notion that the, that uh, uh, the, there is this constitutional right to do that and that it is impermissible to discriminate okay. based on gender identity. Some states prohibit gender right, identity right, discrimination. Right, right. Uh, many states do not. Uh, some general bans on sex discrimination. Some courts have interpreted them, uh, but that's still not, certainly the US Supreme Court has not uh, endorsed that. And then there are various collateral questions. Should it be illegal for people, or at least civilly illegal in the sense that you could get sued, to use a pronoun as to a person that well, you, the speaker, believe is right, but the person believes Right, that would be one example, but I think it touches on equality law and kind of workplace, et cetera, accommodation. So in some ways, naming is one, but the other one is, could you fire somebody? Oh, right, right. Very, very concrete equality law, exactly. because the naming is, if you exactly. name a person, there's, there's an obviously a different kind of cultural dominance. But I also think there's this question, the first question you identified, psychologists, et cetera, um, which treats it as a medical condition. Other people treat it as the right to your identity. So if I decide my name is this in some ways, or I'm treated as, so or I'm perceived right. in a certain way at work, even though it doesn't match right. some other thing on my birth certificate, would you have the right to treat me differently? That, that, Probably right. not, because equality law sort of takes another position. Well, so you cannot. There is no that. general uh, right to your identity under equality law. Certainly, people can't say, for example, well, I belong to some racial group and I should be treated. Uh, in accordance with that racial group. But the flip side is if someone treats you or an individual based on what they perceive your identity to be and just dis and discriminate against you, then the equality law has certain function. Well, only if the equality law bans discrimination right. based right, on right, that right, attribute. Right. So some states, I think probably at this point less than half, right. ban gender identity discriminations. Others don't. Federal law Federal statute doesn't. Some courts have said uh, that the sex uh, discrimination prohibition should be read to cover that. In any case, a really interesting and important debate, right. which is far from resolved. Right. And then again, there's the question: to what extent should people be coerced to use pronouns that uh, uh, that that the that the referred to person yeah. uh, prefers? I would, I would quibble with your word coerced. I would, isn't it? I would if you say to someone you could be them. sued for using the wrong pronoun, of course, that's not coercion. Very, very, first of all, I would just say. I know this debate somewhat because I teach in a university, as you do, so this debate is very big in the university. I think very few people have been sued and very few people have been punished legally for using a wrong pronoun. So well, I that's think, what I'm saying. I think well, should they be? Law is a little no, 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 no. But I'm saying, should they be? Certainly people are calling for that. I've but certainly I, heard calls. And I think they're calling for that for another reason. I think they're calling for that because they want to say the law, as an abstraction, should be cognizant that certain realities exist on the ground. And while I may never sue anybody, I still want to be able to say, you should call me by the name that I prefer. And I think totally. there's, there's these two parts that are linked, and I think that's what I want to go back to when you said, what would be the effect of prohibiting extreme statements? I want to kill this group. And you're saying it won't do very much. I think what it would do, and this is where it's not a legal question, but it would signal something. So in some ways, I think why people are having this really robust and interesting debate on campus because they're saying, 
the reflexive approach said, no, we don't want to to regulate that. It's not good for society to regulate that. And some people are saying, it would be really good if you couldn't put a sentence on my dorm room or chant it on a bus that as a member of this minority group in a slur, I should be strung on a tree or I should be murdered. And that could, even if there's never a lawsuit, which in many laws, as we know, are never applied, never, never works, or it doesn't get thrown out, say that the, that the, the body of the law would signal this we don't really think is so useful and helpful for society. And that's what I think the symbolic import comes in, rather than would someone be sued for having used the wrong pronoun? Unlikely. But it would say, you know what? It's just simply common courtesy when I come into a room and I say, you should refer to me as Uli, and you keep on misnaming me. I say, that's really not, it doesn't function very well. So I am interested in the symbolic importance of well, such as... So there are two separate things, but I want to turn a little bit to the to the uh, pronoun thing, because it's pretty far removed from murder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I totally appreciate that argument. Then there are people who say, I feel I have an obligation to describe the world as it actually is. Mm-hmm. And my understanding is that somebody who is anatomically male mm-hmm. but identifies as female mm-hmm. is actually male. Right. And what's more, I believe that that's the way God made him. By the way, not, not at all my view. I'm an mm-hmm. atheist. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, uh, let's say, let's say uh, believe that's the way God made him. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I want to... Uh, I, I want to say what I think is the truth. This is a, a soldier Nietzsche had this line, although obviously about other things, live not by lies. Right. That even in little things, right, right. we should refuse to go along with what we think is the lie. Right. So there are these interesting questions, it seems to me. Because the other side is the individual is saying, you are using a paradigm that is not the truth. Because right. we've had through history, not that transgender people have suddenly arrived. There's been a history of people right. who as with so many. So it's like what you're saying is someone is saying this is the truth, and the other person seems to be saying this is just how I experience the world, and they're saying it's equally valid. Right. And so the question is, should people be free to express themselves based on what they think is the truth, even right. if others disagree? Right. Or should that be something that could lead to a lawsuit or could re- compel an employer to fire the person or whatever else? Right. So these are all interesting questions. And well, let me just add yeah. one thing. So you're saying it could lead to the person who misnomes, misnames, fire the person. The other person is saying on the other side, it could lead to a lot of things that are also really detrimental to my right. understanding of society. Right. So both right. people are right. claiming actually similar things. Not only one people say, I could be sued. The other person is saying, by you constantly misnaming right. me, you actually destroying my opportunity in this workplace. So I think you've just proven the concern about slippery slopes, mm-hmm. right? We start with, oh, shouldn't it be, mm-hmm. oh, shouldn't the government be able to ban advocacy of murder? Yeah. And now, well, yeah. you know, it could be that all these bad things will yeah. flow from someone using the wrong pronoun. Seems to me that the slippery slopes are a powerful, um, a powerful force in a system, both a legal system but also a social system, maybe even a psychological system right. of humanity that's built on analogy and precedent. Right. And uh, let me ask you something here. This is, I think, at the heart of this conversation is, and then a large body of work says, well, the one category that has to be used here is power and how people are situated in society. So the word situated is probably out of political theory. People like mm-hmm. on, our end, on our end would say everybody's mm-hmm. situated in society. No one is really neutral. There is no such thing. The law has to abstract to a point. But people are saying the law tends to default to people who are already in positions of power and protect their interests rather than doing the job of protecting people who are in minority positions. So free speech law protects people whose speech is being restricted by the government. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Basically... There are a few exceptions, but generally speaking, virtually every one of those people whose speech is being restricted, by definition, does not have power in that situation. He may have power vis-a-vis somebody else, mm-hmm. but it's the government. It could be the government as his employer, it could be the, the university, mm-hmm. it could be uh, the, uh, the government uh, threatening to lock someone up, mm-hmm. exercising their power to suppress this person's right. speech. Right. If the university tells one of my students who could be a straight, rich, white male, we will expel you if you say this, mm-hmm. it seems very hard for me to say how he's the powerful one in that relationship. It's the university that is using its power to restrict okay. his speech. But there's a triangle. So you're saying this student X here, who's an you know, abstract student, the government has a huge amount of power, as we know. The force of the government is inestimable, in a way, toward a citizen. 
but this situation is this person is using his or her power in relation to another person. And the government sort of, in some ways, this is the question, is the government here taking a side and saying, you can say all the stuff you want, and the other person, who, let's presume for the sake of this argument, is the target of that expression, says, you're not looking out for me at all. You're, you're allowing him to do these things to me. Right. And it's, so it's, so it's say, funny that, 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 that some people say not looking out for me at all. Uh, the history of powerless groups in right. America right. getting a wide range of protection, right. wide range of protection against very many things that are not, that are not speech, right. has been the history of them and others whom they've persuaded using speech in order to enlist government power on their side. Mm -hmm. That is emphatically true about blacks, that is emphatically true uh, about uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, sexual minorities. Well, it is a considerable women, right? measure true uh, uh, about women. And I should say, I should say, it is also uh, something where I think uh, uh, First Amendment law has profited tremendously from the First Amendment lawsuit brought by uh, NAACP and, and other such groups mm -hmm. have been tr profited tremendously from lawsuits brought by small religious groups like the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think this has been a great boon all around. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, the only reason we're actually talking, it seems to me, about uh, transgender rights is precisely because, and, and gay rights and such, is precisely because there's been a long uh, uh, history of advocacy protected by the First Amendment that has changed people's minds and that has deployed government power in many situations to use the coercive force of the government in order to protect the interests. I think this is exactly the history that is that people are trying to really understand in great nuance to say minorities in this country have always benefited from using their speech to advance their causes. I think this is correct. I think where people are not in agreement because we can, there's lots of writing on this, they're saying minorities have always used the First Amendment because, for example, the civil rights movement doesn't really use the First Amendment. I mean, yes, the Sullivan, yes. Sullivan cases in New York Times, it's not that NAACP. No, no, no. New York Times v. Sullivan involved an ad. I, no, I understand, but it's not that the, the civil rights leader are suing. No, no. It, no well, uh, it's, 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 it's Sullivan is suing the New York Times and uh, individual I defendants but, who were civil rights but activists. But there is a kind of large debate, sort of, um, you know, Calvin has this book, sort of, the civil rights struggle, they use equality law, not First Amendment law, and it's interesting. They use First Amendment law in order to promote equality law. Mm. NAACP v. Alabama, NAACP v. Button, NAACP v. Claiborne Hardware, those are just the groups that have NAACP, the cases that have NAACP in their name. And so this story that the First Amendment is the tool, not at that very specifically, because you know there's a lot of people who have been written, you know, your colleagues, legal scholars who said, actually, it's not that simple. Actually, the First Amendment is also a tool to protect the powerful. So you have... Of course. It's the so, first, but, so but, in some ways, I'm saying the law can be used both ways. So is this story, is the story what you're saying? Should people put their trust fully in saying it'll be ultimately in your interest to look at the current jurisprudence because you'll, it'll be your turn as well. So as the black civil rights movement, feminist movement, gay rights movement, trans rights movement, you will advance as well because you can speak out against, against oppression, right? Well, I, I was responding to the claim that, oh, this doesn't protect us. Right. It does protect them. It has protected them. And partly through actual litigation victories and partly through, it's true, a lot of this stuff happened, a lot of the civil rights movement happened without, without lawsuits, right. First Amendment lawsuits, but through political advocacy. But the political advocacy was protected to the point where you didn't need the lawsuits in many situations because it was so clearly well established that, uh, uh, that, that the rights uh, uh, were protected. Um, even by the 1960s. Uh, but, uh, uh, but beyond that, um, it, that, it's not that First Amendment will always reach the best result, the right results. The question is, do you think that giving the government more power to restrict speech is going to do a better job? And it's interesting that many of the same people who are arguing uh, for that now are also ones who are sharply critical uh, uh, of uh, the Trump administration. So. I think that, I'm not a supporter. I think you're, you're right. I think this last point, I think you, people are really trying to puzzle through that they say, should there be some way of rethinking our regulation of speech? But we really certainly wouldn't hand this administration the same right. people this right, right now. And this is interesting because it's also shaped by the fact that the president 
participates in speech with great gusto every day and actually says or doesn't say things. So I think the question of moral leadership here is, a, is it one that informs all of this. Because well, would the direction yeah. of the government really be in our interest here? Well, right. So I'm not a supporter of President Trump's. And I think the, that Trump is unusual in various respects, usually mostly in his tone. But how can one possibly think that it somehow it would just be the Trump administration? And then after that, after Trump leaves office, well, then in that case, it's going to be unending progressives to the get-go. Right. Uh, right. That's obviously not right. so at the federal level. It's obviously not so at the state level, mm -hmm. where in fact, actually, the progressive movement, I'm not a member of it, but I'm mm -hmm. speaking to people who, who are and right. who want to restrict speech in the service of progressive causes. The progressive movement is in the minority in state legislatures today. Again, it may not be 10 years mm -hmm. from now, mm -hmm. but it may be again in the minority. 20 years from now. Mm -hmm. So you have to ask yourself, what is the right rule, not just for a time when people on my side right. exercise right. the right. power, the governmental power, but what's the right rule given that we know that sometimes the power will be in hands which we don't trust at all? That's in fact the, well, the historically been the premise of the First Amendment, and that's dating back to the revolution. Right, and it's a good question because it's a question of um, that is partly about jurisprudence, and do you want to trust the law? It's also a question of power, so who has power? In some ways, I think Citizens United changed a lot of people's view and thinking, oh wow, free speech, which we totally endorse, can be used for all sorts of other things. So well, think, if their view is they only endorse it because they think it reaches progressive uh, right, goals right. When, when speech is said right, by, right. Uh, by uh, uh, their friends, then I don't think they really think, have thought hard about free speech. They may, th may have thought hard about how they think politics should operate, right. but that's never been the understanding of free speech. And in fact, actually, uh, first of all, a lot of the media cases, including New York Times, mm -hmm were protecting the powerful because the media has often been powerful. Now, I, again, I should stress, they were protecting them against the government, which was more powerful. But as between, as between the New York Times and Sullivan, probably under any measure of power, New York Times was more powerful than Sullivan himself, as right. opposed to Sullivan with right. the jury on, its, on his side. Uh, on top of that, uh, uh, if you want to look at so corporate speech, the first Supreme Court case upholding uh, freedom of expression rights uh, against government actions in 1931. The first one in holding corporate rights was in 1936. That, that involved a, a uh, corporate-owned newspaper. But the first one involving a corporate non-media entity was, depending on how you count it, 1941 to 1945. Uh, uh, the, uh, the notion that uh, uh, the First Amendment protects employers and employees, protects the right and protects the left. Right. Uh, 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 that notion has been around for a, uh, about as long, at least at the Supreme Court, about as long as the Supreme Court has been taking, uh, has been uh, applying the First Amendment to, to restrain government power. Let me conclude with asking you a concrete question. You teach at UCLA, you're very aware of all the campus debates, sort of, what would you recommend a teacher or instructor should say to a student who says, this is all fine and good, this is the Supreme Court, let's say you're not at UCLA, but you're at a private college, and you're saying, this speech really interferes directly with me studying here, mm -hmm. and there's been racial slurs or attacks on my identity, et cetera, and I really would like this to stop because it is just exhausting to go through my day if right. it's continual. So in some ways, what do you say, not as a, because let's say the law doesn't really, right, totally like, right, you know, Robert Post or Fred right. Shaw would say, maybe it's not quite the First Amendment here. What would you say Absolutely. to a student like that? Let's take a concrete scenario. Imagine somebody comes to my office and says, look, I've always been a devout evangelical Christian. And now I come here and people are saying that, that evangelical Christianity is evil and that it's sexist and homophobic and this and that. And what's more, they're actually saying it's irrational. They're saying people are fools for believing this. Mm -hmm. And now I feel, you were saying, I attack on my identity. I feel that's an attack, he says, on my identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 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 I, I want to know how these people can be shut up so that I can study here and feel like I'm a smart, reasonable person rather than what they think is an irrational fool. I think what I would say is, look, there are a lot of debates about a lot of topics, including about religion and about whether religion is sound or is not. And I'm sure there are there are beliefs that you think are irrational, maybe beliefs of other religions, maybe beliefs that you think are evil. You have the right to express those views. They have the right to express those views. And what's more, you can't, you, you have to train yourself mm 
so that you can study and you can operate mm-hmm. in a way uh, that, uh, uh, that, that, that isn't undermined by others sharply disagreeing with your views and things that are central to your identity. For example, if you're going to law school, one day you may be a lawyer in a courtroom and there may be a witness who is saying these kinds of things and uh, maybe stuff in the record uh, mm-hmm. about those kinds of things. And if you freeze up and if you say, you know, I can't operate uh, on, uh, on full power because mm-hmm. of this, then you're not doing a very good job for your client, are you? Well, and in fact, if you are, imagine that you are out there as an advocate for conservative Christianity. You join the Alliance Defending Freedom in order to protect religious freedom rights. In order to be the best advocate you can be for that, you have to underst- have heard and understood and figured out how to respond to the right. other side's arguments, however offensive and wrong those arguments might be. What do you think the question is about that you said earlier that the, one of the questions around uh, President Trump's statements is tone. So if a student comes tomorrow and maybe not at UCLA to private school and says, I'm a Muslim student mm-hmm. and I've seen stuff on the sidewalk here that are really anti-Muslim, very violent, very aggressive, after what happened in New Zealand two mm-hmm. days ago. This is deeply upsetting to me. So this is not an evangelical Christian who says, I have a hard time because people don't agree with my views, but saying, I feel personally targeted and I don't feel anybody in this administration is saying this is a bad thing. They're just saying, well, we condemn all sorts of hate. He says, this was targeting my group. So, so is it just a, so a, it, it, not as a legal question. What the, the reason I gave the evangelical yeah. uh, uh, Christian as an example, you you said well something that that that, that is uh, uh, targeting their identity. You you didn't limit it. No, no, to I, no the example. Yeah, totally, so now I'm we're so now, now, now we're moving example. to that. So he's going to university, right. and there's this there's this uh, chalking on the sidewalk, right. saying kill all Muslims. So m- one of my questions is. How often does it happen that a university, that when the university hears about it, they really say, oh, we just don't care? They say lots of things. I honestly, they say, I honestly think what's interesting, the university yeah. would most likely wash it off the sidewalk, except when the media caught, catches wind of it. And then it becomes okay. immediately, and this is what I'm interested yeah. in, then it becomes immediately a First Amendment debate when it has maybe very little to do with that because maybe it's defacing a sidewalk, maybe it's a private university, maybe the person was... So in some ways, I think why universities don't take a step here to say, we actually really don't think this is a really productive thing to have our sidewalk and we don't have to bring the Supreme Court, the ACLU, and every lawyer in the country. They, they do this. That's, that's they what do I, that. mean. That's what I mean. In fact, I, I routinely they... see when similar things happen at UCLA, there are these letters from the, uh, from the dean, from the chancellor that say this. And of course, the university is entitled uh, to, to exercise its own free speech rights. And I do agree that that's often much more productive than saying, we're going to find the person who did it, we're going to expel them. Uh, right. So, so if if what this what the student wants, and I think I totally understand why he'd want, is reassurance that he is a valued member of the community, and that these views that, uh, are the views of a of a tiny faction. These views being kill all Muslims, let's say, right. being a tower, kill all Jews, and uh, take my group, are a tiny tiny fraction uh, uh, of the community. Uh, then it seems to me uh, that that he could he could have that, and he should have that. But if but if the consequence is well, all right. I actually want uh, uh, people's criticisms of Islam or criticisms of Jews or criticisms of trans of transgen- uh, uh, transgender people uh, to be silenced because that is what I need in order to uh, to be maximally productive. I think the answer the answer is no. I think that's not the right uh, solution. And you talk about symbolism. Part of the problem is if you do say, well, we need to actually ban something for the symbolism, then that seems to suggest the things you aren't banning, you're symbolically endorsing. Right. So, uh, so as a result, things that are deliberately by, by the rule on the other side of the line may actually become therefore more offensive to people because they've gotten used to the notion that things, things on this line side of the line are banned. Well, why not, the, uh, why not those things as well? I think the important thing is that what you said, that the deans, provost, et cetera, chancellor send out letters, I think that there can be a very strict and precise way of dealing with it legally, and then there's more leadership, which can also do that without running afoul of the law. To say, for example, we don't condone any of this without immediately, and I think that sentence is sometimes, not always, but it's sometimes missed by students who say that it's too quick to say, well, the law. And people say, that's not what I was asking about. I was asking, what am I supposed to do here if people say these things around me? Is, is everybody here in agreement? And for the university then to say, 
no, actually, that is not what you just said. It's isolated incidents. So I think people want to have a space to be able to say, I don't think the sentiment is productive for the for the community we're part of without saying we must now refer but, immediately. But uh, surely they do. And as I said, I see this all the time. And I think rightly so. I will say there are times when I think it is overused. Uh, that if, sorry, if somebody is, uh, uh, for example, sharply criticizing some, some religion, but in a way that is, I think, potentially productive, at least insofar as it could have a debate about which religious ideologies are good for society and for their adherence and for minority groups within the group itself, mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and which are not. So I, I don't think that any time somebody's identity is right. challenged in some measure, there ought to be this public denunciation. But surely for advocacy of violence, or for that matter for slurs, it seems to me perfectly proper for universities to say, this, this, is, this is wrong and it's hateful, and also, it's not the sort of thing that you that universities should be about. You, if you have views, express them in a way that that, that is part of a serious debate, uh, rather than uh, uh, rather than through some anonymous slurs uh, uh, or or something like that. My, my sense is I don't know if you agree. My sense is actually that the the debate happens much more at universities. I actually am somewhat puzzled and quite interested why the media debate focuses on incidents that are really not always representative of what happens. I mean, I teach a debate on school, you do as well. There are thousands and thousands of events every year. There are. And then sometimes you hear about one as if it's the determining right, event. Right, right. So to me, the thing, and, and you're quite right, that a lot of what's the real question isn't what does the First Amendment call for, but what's actually what kind of climate should we try to create with universities? Mm -hmm. My sense is, and I may be wrong, but my sense is there are many institutions in which very many students uh, just are, uh, refuse to talk about things like abortion or mm -hmm. like about affirmative action mm -hmm. or about transgender rights. Uh, because they're afraid that they're going to be the target of some tweet storm. Mm -hmm. They're going to possibly lose jobs as a result. Mm -hmm. They're probably not so much afraid of being punished for violating a campus speech code. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, uh, they're afraid that they're going, to, uh, they're going to be punished by prospective employers. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't remember the last time, for example, at my own law school, there was a debate on abortion. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't feel super strongly about abortion myself. I'm, prob I'm generally kind of in the... Uh, sort of uh, tentative pro-choice camp, I suppose, like so many people are. Uh, but I think there ought to be debates about that. I think people just, just have, many people have never heard the other side, even though we know that the country as a whole is split 60-40 yeah. on first trimester abortions in favor, and then in a sense 75-25 for later abortions, according to many polls. Uh, likewise about, about uh, transgender rights. I, I actually had on my blog uh, a visiting uh, blogger just this last week, Dorian Coleman from Duke. Oh, I read this um, yeah. uh, and uh, she was writing about, and, and I think she's not in general against transgender rights, but she thinks that uh, uh, women's sports should be protected against male to female transgender athletes who have the benefits of basically male physiology and male hormones. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, and I'm inclined to, to think that she's probably right, but I would certainly love to hear uh, uh, two views. How many students do you think at, in, at either of our institutions would feel reluctant to even bring that up in class for fear of being labeled bigots? Yeah, it's just an impression. I'm, it's hard to say. It is hard to say. I, I agree. It's an impression of my I actually think I'm quite happy that people express opinions that other people disagree with so vehemently, but I think it works. But I think you're right generally in campus. I'm not sure. And the other part you mentioned that there's social media, so it's hard, so it's coming. Right, and I would say actually one thing that I think universities should also do, again, without any suppression, but when they see some students being excoriated for being bigots or racists or whatever, not big, not the KKK, people right. KKK who are marching around KKK uh, hoods, those are bigots and racists. Right. But if they're being excoriated for basically just saying, you know, I think race-based affirmative action is wrong, or I think that uh, uh, that uh, uh, the case for transgender rights has not been shown, I think it would be good for the dean to send out a message saying, look, obviously people have the right to express that view and to condemn that view as bigoted. But I would rather that people actually seriously sit down and try to put on events where people could talk about it, rather than just saying bigot, 
racist, uh, uh, hateful, uh, because otherwise, even if you're absolutely right that that ideology is wrong-headed, how can you learn to be a better advocate for your own position if you don't hear the best possible case for it? Uh, uh, asserted, and I think that's a perfectly legitimate thing for uh, for the university to do. And by the way, that's what I think I would do in my classroom. That if I find somebody making a position and somebody else just sort of dismissing it, uh, poo pooing it as clearly idiotic or hateful or whatever else, I. I would, would say. But you said you would look at the statement. You say this is not right. a hateful statement. This is a reasonable, this is the whole thing. The university is supposed to say this is a reasonable position versus other things which are just not reasonable. And we know there are right. some things, and you would say in your classroom, that is not the way you can talk to or about anybody. Right, right. It's very so I think that's absolutely right. And I think one way of thinking about it is what we would do in our own classrooms, where in fact, First Amendment rights, even in the public university, are by. Are, are, if they, to the extent they exist, they're very slight. Obviously, discussion in my classroom can't be content neutral, can't even be viewpoint neutral, right. can't be free from speech compulsions. I could call on someone and say, please make the best argument for X. He says, well, I don't agree with X. I say, you want to be a lawyer. You need to understand how to make the best argument for X. Uh, and somebody else says something else. I say, no, no, that's not what we're talking about now. Right. Uh, so, so I think that's an excellent example of, of how we should think about uh, figuring out what's good for debate. Uh, and not just what the ostensible legal rules are. Uh, and uh, I think even, you're quite right, even in other areas where there are First Amendment constraints or broader academic freedom constraints, I do think that those, the adults in the room, those people who have been given the power, should use it not to suppress but to speak out. Uh, but I do think that they should speak out, among other things, to encourage uh, uh, De debate even on subjects that do go to the heart of some people's identities yeah. well, uh, rather than just try to suppress them. The thing is that the people um, who've spoken on campus, they are taking all sorts of positions. I think the interesting thing is there are lots of debates. I think it isn't always just shutting down. They also well, it certainly isn't always just right. shutting down. But it's forcing people into a conversation sometimes who want to say their positions are self-evident. So I think that's also what has happened at campus Look, it's quite right that for every debate that is shut down, there are, a, there are a thousand probably that go on, although there are probably 10 to 100 that don't happen because of one version or another, either the shutdown, and then there may be two to 300 that don't happen because people just don't want the pushback of that. But of course, we can't tell. How can we tell? No, right. Because they didn't happen, right? Know, These are counterfactual. Kind of we didn't know. Uh, uh, right, right. So, so I think it's quite right uh, that uh, uh, we shouldn't assume there's no debate at universities uh, because we see a few, a few uh, shut down, just like we shouldn't assume that, oh, American Jews like me are in constant danger of being murdered because we're Jews, simply because unfortunately some Jews have been murdered because we're Jews. Uh, so we can't we can't let those those the rare incidents stand in for the whole the whole uh, 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 problem. Uh, uh, but we also uh, it seems to me uh, ought to consider the incidents when we're deciding what legal rules there ought to be. Right. Uh, my last question is: Can you tell me you run a blog? I do. You've been running it for a long time. Right? Uh, since two thousand two. Yes. So it's the that, that, that's a hundred in blog years. That's a hundred in blog. Exactly. I know. Tell us the name of the blog. So it, can look this it's up. called the Volok Conspiracy, yes. and it's a bunch <laughs> of law professors and me. Uh, and was founded in 2002. We were at the Washington Post for several years, uh, a few years ago, and now we're hosted by Reason Magazine. Right, so so it's reason.com slash volume. So I'll link it in the, in the notes Sounds for the good. show. Thank you so much, Eugene, for Ulrich, joining me on the podcast today. Thank you. Very much appreciate it.